All right. Um, up here on the screen is our feeding uh, this past week for Christmas. The village that we went to was, um, um, it had a lot of uh, older people in it. And um, good people, wonderful people. I was told today um, that they, they do, they, they have been calling the office of our radio station, and I don't know if they're being put on the air or not, but they have been calling the radio station office there in Turkana in Lodwar, and um, they are, people are saying things like, we would have been dead had it not been for Ekayokan Radio. We would have been dead. And uh, people, that just blessed my heart. That did. And um, it's, it's funny because when I first had the notion to feed people, um, I was thinking about doing it here uh, in this area. And uh, I brought it up to Michael. And uh, Michael was talking to uh, his cousin out there who helps us in our, with our stations. And um, she said, Michael, she said, there are people in Turkana dying every day from starvation. Every single day. And I, I, when Michael told me that, I, I immediately said, okay, that's it right there. That's what God was wanting. And I have no doubt in my mind about it. And uh, so the testimony from the people um, concerning the uh, food program uh, is that they, it, it literally has saved people's life. People would have been dead by now. Uh, had it not been for that and to that I give all the praise and all the glory to God it was his idea and not only has it been his idea it's been his work uh, it has been God who has provided the funding God who has provided uh, the workers and allowed us to find food set at times when food uh, is scarce to be found and, um, and, and just the fact that um, really no one has tried to, uh, no one's tried to intervene and stop what we're doing. I, I, and I, the reason why I say that is there's a lot of jealousy uh, on the part of certain religious groups who are not doing this and they don't like the fact that we are to them. To, the, to them, and these poor people, these poor religious backslid people, all they can think of is our feeding these people makes them look bad. That's all they care about, is that they look bad. And I'm going, well, there's an easy fix to that. Out feed us. You feed twice as many people and I'll let you get all the praise and glory. I don't care. So, um, but anyway, yeah, the, the people there, they are grateful. They're calling the stations. Uh, there's the station there and they're, they're listening uh, to the messages. They're hearing the word of God. There is no doubt in my mind that people are probably are being saved. And uh, to that, we give God all the praise uh, and all the glory for that. I just, uh, especially when I see the little ones there. That just really, really, really uh, blesses my heart. And um, uh, by the way, there, there was something that came up uh, in the news feed this week. Big, I don't know if you saw, I'm surprised. If you haven't seen it, I'm surprised you haven't. They, uh, an, a mystery has been uncovered and it is now known 
who Bigfoot is. Yeah. Got him on film. Some of y'all are going, see, I knew that was fake. <laughs> All right. We're going to go to Ephesians 4, whether we're post to or not. Amen. You just do what I tell you to do. You go to Ephesians 4 or else. You'll be in the wrong place. I don't know where I got lost. I don't know where I got mixed up. But, but anyway, the Lord be praised. Amen. It doesn't matter where we go. I don't know. I don't know if you remember this. Some of you, um, you, this goes back to when I first started doing Pastor Mike online, and I was I was trying to come up with ideas of things to do in an hour long broadcast. And so for the first, I don't know, six months, maybe ten months, maybe a year, something like that, I did what I called a, an R A M. A random access, um, that wouldn't be an M, would it? But anyway, a random access Bible study. And I would take my Bible, and I would open it up, and wherever it opened to, we'd do a Bible study right there. Start right there. You know, you can do that. You can, pick, you can just take your Bible and roll the dice and flip it open and start reading and start studying and God will give you learning. Amen. There is just no way you can lose reading and studying God's word. So um, I turn to Philippians 4. So let's just go to Philippians. No, that's not. We're not going to do that. Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, that way I'm a little bit more prepared uh, for the lesson tonight. I appreciate y'all being here. Uh, continue to pray for uh, some folks that are sick. And lift them up, if you would, please. In fact, let's go to the Lord right now and ask his blessings upon his word tonight. And uh, uh, just tell God, thank you for all that he's blessed you with. Christmas time is over. And, um, and now we can just kind of sit back and relax a little bit. And, um, and just take it all in about how good God has been to us. All right. Father, we do love you and we thank you, Lord. Uh, for the time uh, set aside, uh, Lord, where we just um, we just we just kind of sit back, Father, and and we just think of our blessings and think of how you blessed us and what you've done for us and how you, Lord, you you brought us to salvation, how you, how you saved our family, how you saved our kinfolk, our loved ones, how how Father God, you you've, you've uh, rescued us out of terrible things, Lord, that we got ourselves into, a Lord, that maybe the devil just trapped us. And we cried unto the Lord, and you heard us, and you pulled our feet out of the fire, and you saved us, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you for that. And Lord, uh, we just ask God that this coming year, you would give us some people Lord that um, could be uh, on our heart as we pray for them people Lord that we would want to pray for and that people that we would want to see them saved father I've got people in my mind in my heart that I've been wanting to see saved for a long time and I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would do that. Lord, you, I would like for you to do it this year. But if you don't, I will just trust, Father, in your, um, in your plan and your program that you have a time and a season for everything under the sun. And Father, I pray, Lord, God, that whether you do it sooner or whether you do it later, Lord, that you would save the people, Father, that uh, we are praying for and the people that we love and the people that we know. 
And Lord, Father, life would be, it just seemed like life would be so much sweeter. Because now the people that we love and the people that we talk to all the time, the people, Lord, that we visit with all the time, now we have a, a, a same thing to talk about. How Jesus died for us, how he rose again on the third day. And we can just talk and talk and talk about the wondrous blessings of the Lord. Father, we ask tonight, God, that you open up your word and speak to our hearts. And Father, there must be a reason why, Lord, we've kind of moved things around a little bit. And I pray, God, that you would bless that and uh, bless, Father, the confusion of my mind. That uh, even though, Lord, this might be on the wrong night, uh, Lord God, that somehow you'd make it on the right night and just teach us great and mighty things, we pray. And we do pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, in Ephesians 4, let tell you what let's do. Let's read from verse 1 down through. Uh, I have verses 8 and through 10 up on the screen. But let's kind of get... Um, our, our back up a little bit and kind of get the understanding of this. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, uh, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I do remember us talking about that and going into that. Um, verse 4, there was one body and one spirit. And um, uh, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. I had um, uh, Sunday when... Um, when uh, um, Brother Dave came down and to the altar and and said that he wanted to be saved, he wanted to know that, that he would know for sure that he'd be saved. And I went through the Romans Road of Salvation with him and his and his daughter. And uh, afterwards was talking to him and his uh, family, his wife and uh, his wife's daughter and so on and said that uh, he, and they said now, She's been baptized, but uh, she was a, a baby when she was baptized. Does that count? And I said, well, no, not really. And I kind of went into Romans 1. I went into uh, the Ethiopian eunuch and he asked the question, uh, uh, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And, and Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And, and the eunuch made the, made the call. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ uh, is the Son of God. And so it takes belief to be to be baptized. And I said, a baby can't believe because they don't know anything. And I said, and just, just you know, that baptism that she would have gotten in the Catholic Church wouldn't count. And right here in this passage, and it says it very clearly, there is one body and one spirit, even as you're called and one hope of your calling. In verse 5, one Lord, one faith, and... How many baptisms? There's one. And so, you know, the question was, uh, should I be, uh, or should she be baptized again? Well, in my opinion, yes, there's one baptism. And the one that she got from that Catholic priest it was not believer's baptism. It was not believer's baptism. And so I, I would say that to anybody. In fact, when I... Uh, when people ask me, you know, can I be baptized? I don't just say, sure, I'll baptize you. I want to know that they know they're saved and that they know they're going to heaven even without being water baptized. They know for a fact they're going to heaven because I don't want to baptize somebody and them think, uh, you know, 10, 20 years down the road, well, uh, you know, Pastor Mike Hoggard, uh, he baptized me, so I know I'm going to heaven. I don't want anybody blaming their trip to hell on me. Amen? So anyway, all right. Uh, verse 7, he said, uh, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift 
of Christ. And we discussed that, how uh, it just seemed like some people just need more grace than others. Or maybe some people on certain days need more grace uh, than others. A lot of times uh, the holidays... Uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas are not joyous, festive occasions for some people. Maybe because somebody passed away during that time or whatever. And that person needs more grace than the rest of us during that time. They need a, they need a, a more, a greater measure of, of God's grace. And God will give it to them. He certainly will. Uh, and so in verse 8, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up, on high, he led captive, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And now I'm going to read verse nine with this and I'm going to back up a little bit. Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Now, I know this might sound a little confusing, but let's run through it very quickly. So he says here, verse 8, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave uh, gifts unto men. So we know, and, and verse 9, now, he, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended First, into the lower parts of the earth. So here's what we know. On the day of Christ's death, his body was put into the tomb, but it didn't stink. Amen. No need for a Glade plug-in. Nothing. Now, his soul descended to the lower parts of the earth. To preach. He's preaching to those who are going to remain down there. Because of their lack of faith. But then he's going to take those who have had faith. Since the beginning. And he is going to set captivity free. He's going to, he's going to let them loose. And that's what that means here. It says in verse 9, now, he, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. So he went down to the lower parts of the earth, says to Abra everybody in Abraham's bosom, you're free. I, I, think it's gonna, I think it would look like the play that you guys did for Christmas. And, the, and Jesus said, everybody get up, you're free. That would be how I would hear that as that play. That was... Genius writing. Okay. So Jesus says, Everybody get up, you're free. And everybody goes, Woo! And so he led captivity free, led captivity captive. All right. So then he, he, he did that first. Then, um, verse 10, he that descended is the same also. That ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So once he's descended down to the lower parts of the earth. Now he's going to rise up from there. He's going to minister. And he's going to give gifts unto men. And then he's leaving. He's taking everybody that he promised to up there to heaven. Okay. Now, it says in verse 8, Wherefore he saith, when he, asc when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. What does that mean? Gave gifts unto men. Like roses and perfume and... Huh? The Holy Ghost. What else? Gifts, plural. Okay, perform of miracles, prophecy, sprechensy up, gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, and since they are gifts, what do you need to do to get them? Just 
believe. Um, I have a friend, a longtime friend. Uh, he's since come out of that, but he he was saved. He was brought. You know, sometimes you can be brought to the Lord in Egypt, but God will take you out of there and into the promised land, okay? And so I don't doubt his salvation. Uh, but he was going to a united Pentecostal church. Now, united Pentecostal is, is a denomination that is very works-based, appearance based uh rules based uh denomination that does not believe in the godhead of the father the son and the holy spirit being one they do not believe that and when you ask them okay so what about first john 5 7 well the catholics added that in there that should never be in there well that's that how convenient the one verse that basically destroys their entire doctrine and their whole church's reason for living, they say, well, that verse should have never been in there. But anyway, that's what they believe. And he, uh, his experience was that he got under conviction during the message. He went down to the altar. He was praying for salvation. And when, when they got done with the salvation part, that's when they started um, the works of tongues and when I say the works of tongues I mean they uh, told him now you have to speak in tongues to show that you have been that you have received the gift of the Holy Ghost and so they said uh, close your eyes hold your hands in the air now say hallelujah so he said hallelujah and they said now say it again he said it again now say it faster and they had him basically going faster and faster and faster with the hallelujah until stuff started coming out of his mouth. And they all went, Woo! He got it! And then everybody started in tongues. And, you know, I had a talk with him after that. He's, he's come out of that. But he recognized that they basically pulled that out of him and I I know of stories I've heard people um, you know three years down in Richwoods down in that area down there there is a Pentecostal church on every hill and two and every holler okay and uh, one one guy said that he was um, uh, I think that he was there doing some repairs on the church and it was, he got him, it, it held him over late, like on a Wednesday or Thursday night, whenever they were going to have their service. And he said, those people got up and just started running around that sanctuary. And when he asked somebody what they're doing, he said, well, they're running in the Holy Ghost. That's how they get the Holy Ghost in there. They're going to run in the Holy Ghost. And uh, I'm sorry, but if it's a gift, it's a gift. Okay, um, it would be like if Alicia made Malachi run around the living room 16 times before she gave him his gifts for Christmas. Okay. Okay, are you worthy now? Uh -huh. No, you're not. 16 more. Okay, um, that's not a gift. It's not a gift. And so that kind of stuff, I just, it, it's almost laughable. Uh, and then, then you've got the snake people out in eastern Tennessee, eastern Kentucky, up in the mountains of West Virginia and so on, uh, that, you know, they take the verse that, you know, if you take up, if you take up serpents or you shall take up serpents and so on, um, they take that and say that they must take up serpents to show that they have the gift. They have to show everybody that they have the gift. And uh, believe it or not, there's been quite a few deaths uh, in that area of people 
who believed that they had to take up snakes and dance around with them and all kinds of stuff. And they got bit and died. Lo and behold, they died. Uh, or people drank poison and they died. Because that was what the, they believed that the scripture told them that they must do that. No, what you're doing is that you are tempting the Lord your God. You're demanding God that God, I am going to drink this poison and you promised that you wouldn't let me die. Now you better not let me die or you'll break your word. They drink the poison. God lets them die. And uh, all that is, is a works-based uh, system whereby if you perform the works and do them the right way, then you will get the gift. If you don't do it the right way, you won't get the gift. And the, the scorn will be laid upon you that you didn't do it right and you didn't have the faith. Therefore, God's punishing you by uh, allowing you to be bit or allowing you to get sick from the poison or whatever. But God is punishing you because you just didn't have enough faith uh, when you did it. And like I say, people, I can, I can just go on this all night. It is you are tempting the Lord your God. He gave gifts unto men. Paul when he was picking up sticks to throw into the fire, he was not looking for sticks that had snakes on them. He didn't know there was a, a serpent in there. He's throwing sticks in there and a serpent leapt out of that fire, latched onto Paul, injected its poison. Paul shook the beast into the fire. And everybody's looking for at Paul. They're waiting for him to swell up and die. But when he doesn't, they start saying, he's one of the gods. And Paul has the opportunity right then and there. God let that happen for Paul to, to give Paul the opportunity to preach the gospel to them. And he said, I'm not, I'm not God. I'm not an angel. I'm just a man just like you are. But let me tell you what just happened here. And Paul used that to preach the gospel to them. And, and probably some of them were converted. And uh, but anyway, this is this is uh, this is God. And he is giving gifts unto men. And those gifts, like I say, if God. You know, I'm. I've, I've always thought it would be neat. If one of these days I went to Kenya and God gave me the Turkana language while I'm preaching to him, I thought it would be neat if God would do that. Do I believe he can? Yeah, I believe he can. Okay. Um, why he hasn't, I don't know. But if he did, it would certainly be a gift from God and not anything I deserved, not anything I had coming to me. I'd even let God give it to Chris if he wanted it. Amen. OK, uh, but anyway, he gave he gave gifts unto men. And uh, by the way, there is a there is a, uh, a marriage aspect to this. What does the bridegroom do to uh, sort of persuade the, the bride that I'm the fella for you? Give her gifts. Amen. Buy her roses. Buy her sweet things. Buy her earrings. Buy her rings. Buy her perfume. Buy her a nice dress. Spend your money on her. Amen. 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 Listen, my wife tells me, she says, you know, when it comes to Christmas time, she says, well, you know what always works for me. And I do. Jewelry. Can't go wrong with jewelry. If I can't figure out something else to get her, jewelry. I get her some jewelry. 
Uh, amen. Now listen to this now. Okay. Um, all right, let's, let's move forward here. Uh, in verse 11. Now, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the, some of the other gifts that he gives is that number one, he gave some apostles. Now, we believe that the Bible is very clear that there is no such thing as apostolic succession. In other words, none of the apostles granted some of their uh, disciples uh, the ability themselves to become apostles because apostles, they have certain qualifications that were given to us in early on in the book of Acts. Number one, they, they, had, they must have walked with Christ uh, during his ministry. Uh, they were witnesses of his preaching, his teaching, of his miracles. Uh, they were witnesses of his death, of his burial, of his resurrection, and so on. And they were, they were witnesses of all of these things. Um, and so that is how uh, the, the apostles were selected. And so some apostles... Some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers understand that at this time there is no solidified canon of the scriptures. We use that term canon of the scriptures to uh, denote the completed work and the unified work of the Holy Bible as even though being written by somewhere around 40 different men over the, the space of about 2,000 years uh, or more than that, uh, that um, finally we have the whole of God's Word put together into a single book. And that is where all of what we believe, all of what we think and know, and what we uh, seek after, all of it will be right here in this one book. Now, during, during the time of Paul and Peter and James and John and of these men, the, that book was in the works. It was being written. Paul, we know, was already, in fact, I can't remember what book it was, but he gave instructions. He said, take this book that I'm giving to you and send it to the church of Laodicea. And the, and the letter that I wrote to Laodicea, have them send you a copy of it and you read it in your church. So we know that uh, the, the things that were being written were passed around to the churches and they were using them for their doctrine, for their understanding, for their belief, for their preaching, and so on. Uh, also during that time, because you're talking about, you're not really talking about books that are like this, uh, you're talking about books that look like big scrolls, okay? Well, those were hard to... Manage, let's say that uh, I was going to preach uh, this message 2,000 years ago. How many scrolls would I have to have by me here? Okay. And so what they had, uh, uh, what were they called? Um, oh, I can't remember the term for them. But what they did was, was that uh, maybe a, a minister or somebody who was going to preach... A, a, a lectern, I think it might, might have been what it was called. But anyway, they would take a portion of the scriptures from various scrolls and they would copy them down and they would use that 
for uh, what they were going to preach from. And they would have all the, the scripture verses there. Uh, now let me just throw something at you here. Um, it is known, it is known that as far as um, any of the Greek manuscripts that has 1 John 5, 7 in it, which says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. It is true that the oldest Greek manuscript of the, the epistle of John only goes back to 1000 AD. In other words, we don't have a copy of 1 John that, go, that is earlier than 1000 AD that has 1 John 5, 7 in it. Okay? So that gives those who go after these new versions and they like these corrupt manuscripts, they say, aha! See? It's not there. However, those, uh, those lecterns that I, that's not the word for them. I can't think of the word. Huh? No. Um, but on, some, on many of those that are older than 1000 AD, 1 John 5, 7 is in there. So we have their, them as a testimony. We also have um, the writing of, what is his name? I wasn't prepared to talk about this, but um, anyway, he was a, uh, a Bible scholar from around 300 A.D. Huh? Cyprian, thank you. Cyprian wrote a book, and in that book he said, and as our dear beloved John said, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. In other words, 300 years after after Christ's birth, Cyprian said, I saw it in there. It was in there. Okay? Now, by this time, you, Paul has already said it. Paul said, uh, for we, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. There were already people who were corrupting the Greek manuscripts, taking things out, putting things in and so on and so the um, those who were uh, believing in in false doctrine uh, those who are of the Gnostic orders uh, they didn't believe that um, Jesus was God and so certainly they couldn't have a Greek manuscript that had Jesus as God in it so first John 5 7 comes out and uh, so we can clearly see that they that they took it out and mashed in the the two verses verses six and verses eight together to make it look like it never was there to begin with okay but anyway so what you have at this time and from Ephesians 4 is that you have the ministry the apostles the prophets the evangelists the pastors and the teachers and all of them are, um, they are maintaining the integrity of God's word. In the Old Testament, God used the priesthood and the scribes to make sure that every single letter was copied correctly and if it was off by a letter they burnt the whole manuscript they did that's why we just there just really isn't any argument over what the old testament says the argument is over the new testament because god didn't use the levite priest obviously 
uh, for the New Testament because primarily you're talking about Gentiles. But it's using the ministry of uh, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, and so on to maintain the uh, perfection of the, the, the writings of what come out to be the New Testament. So as those men get a copy of what Paul wrote, let's say, to, to the Thessalonian church, uh, there would be a man in that church who would be charged with writing and copying out every word and every letter uh, in, to a new copy so that that church could have its own copy of 2 Thessalonians, okay? And any other book that that got sent to them, there was a man or maybe a group of men who were charged with writing and copying down those words that they got to make sure that the word of God remained intact. So in other words, Old Testament, God used the priesthood of the Levites to preserve his word. New Testament, God used the priesthood of the believers to preserve his word. God is determined, was determined, and is determined that his word was going to remain not only originally inspired, but uh, preserved throughout all generations, just like he said. Amen? And this is going to be done in verse 13 till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God knows right now that not all of us agree on everything. Not all of us in this one church agree on everything. Imagine how it is in the churches all over the world. And yet God knows who his People are. Jesus knows who his body is. And one of these days, we're all going to be perfect according to his word. Amen, 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 amen. 